So my name is Wenfei. Um, I'm actually a, I'm, I work at Cardo, uh, Cardo DB formerly, but Cardo now as a data scientist. But um, I'm going to be presenting some of the work that I did um, at MIT at the Civic Data Design Lab. Um, and it's called The Ghost Cities of China. So I'm sure many of you have heard about um, and have seen images of the vast empty cities in China. Um, but as with many stories in the media, the truth is often different or more nuanced than how it's presented. And so um, we at the Civic Data Design Lab wanted to dig deeper into the question of what does ghost city actually mean? Um, so after working on this project for a while, I can tell you that the story is complex. Um, there is certainly a real estate crisis in China that represents a unique pattern in Chinese development, but it's not quite like what we see in the news. Um, so our goal here was really twofold. Uh, first is to create a model that would allow us to identify ghost city areas, or at least areas that are very good candidates for ghost cities. Um, the second was to develop a better characterization of the Chinese real estate ecosystem. So a bit of background uh, here that would explain why the ghost city condition is uh, complex and nuanced. Um, and when we talk about ghost cities, we're actually um, not just talking about oversupply, but also vacancy. So it's really underutilization of two kinds. Um, and so by oversupply, we mean you know, when developers um, build buildings that are unsold, basically or half-built apartments. Um, but the other kind of utilization is vacancy, or underutilization uh, is vacancy. And this means that um, apartments have been built and sold, but no one lives there. Um, there are a couple of reasons why. Like for instance, um, sometimes people, people buy apartments for um, investment, for um, land speculation purposes. Um, other times people buy like spare apartments for their, um, their children or their elderly parents in the future. Um, so the question here is, uh, can we find ghost cities by capturing social media data and use it to create an indicator for apartments that are underutilized? Uh, we collected a ton of social media data from China. Um, and so there's basically a Chinese version of um, every kind of social media outlet that we're familiar with here. Um, so there's like Chinese Yelp and Chinese Craigslist and Chinese Google and Chinese MapQuest and Chinese Tinder. Um, we ended up uh, using three, uh, three data sources, and the first being um, Jianping, which is the equivalent of Chinese Yelp, and it functions in very much um, the same way. Um, and the other two data sources that we used were uh, AMAP and Baidu, which are basically like Chinese um, MapQuest and Chinese Google. And we used um, AMAP and Baidu, basically their API to get um, residential points of interest. Uh, so we collected data for 22 different cities across China, most of which were second and third tier cities. And the reason why we focus more on kind of lower tier cities is because you generally see this um, underutilization condition happening more in the um, developing or kind of just developing uh, cities in China rather than bigger cities like, um, like uh, uh, Beijing or Shanghai. Um, so we focused on three test cities. And that's uh, Chengdu, Tianjin, and Shenyang. Um, so one of the main points I would like to emphasize here in this presentation is that we use um, a mixed methods approach um, when addressing the question of ghost cities. And I think it's actually a really important approach for cartographic research in general. Um, so we believe that you know, meaningful research is not simply about the data or the model itself, but also kind of putting things into context. So to really have your cartographic research and methods make an impact in policy decisions that can ultimately influence um, urban space, you know, you, you really need to talk to kind of uh, different stakeholders um, and ground truth your data uh, in a way that can allow you to kind of develop a broader comprehensive understanding of a particular issue. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about the kind of qu uh, the quantitative aspect uh, of our modeling. The basic premise of the model is basically that um, access to amenities is essential for thriving communities, and this can be an indicator of likelihood, uh, or sorry, of livelihood or lack thereof in the city. 
Um, so first, we uh, created a data set of all the residential areas in the city. And we use this, and we do this by um, using the AMAP and the Baidu residential POIs that I mentioned earlier. Um, and because some of these points represent individual buildings, and some, some of these other, others of these points represent um, basically like the centroid of a community uh, development, we had to aggregate the data. So what we did was we created a 300 by 300 meter grid overlay on top of these points. 300 by 300 meters being roughly the size of um, a residential development. Um, and we kept track of which grids contained residential POIs. And we also kind of kept track of uh, which, uh, which are the neighbors of these, uh, of these grids. Um, so then what we did was for each grid, we calculated this thing called um, the amenity score, which is basically the opportunity divided by um, the distance. And the opportunity here is a number of ratings, um, each of the different amenities we uh, captured, the different ratings for each of those amenities. Um, and this had, uh, I created an option for, um, for weighting these different amenities based on how much more or less of an indicator it is for livelihood. Um, so basically, the reason why we had this um, weighting, uh, uh, weighting indicator is because um, you, see, uh, you see places like bars or restaurants being kind of rated more heavily than some place like a hospital. And that's kind of to be expected from kind of this retail-facing data set like Denping. And then you divided by, and then I divided um, that opportunity by the distance, uh, distance weighting. Um, so how far away the amenity is from that residential cell. And we use a Euclidean distance. Um, so you can see that, for instance, um, the restaurant is generally closer to a residential um, grid than a mall, for instance. That, that makes a lot of sense. There are generally more restaurants around in the neighborhood. They're more kind of local neighborhood restaurants. And places like kind of malls or hospitals tend to be kind of much fewer and far between. Okay, so to recap, um, first I calculate the centroid of each residential cell, um, and then we find the reviews for the 10 closest amenities. I should mention the types of amenities we use are kind of the uh, kind of amenities that you would use for kind of normal everyday life. So um, restaurants, bars, uh, or KTVs rather, um, schools, hospitals, banks, grocery stores. Uh, yeah, that's it. So we find the reviews for the 10 closest amenities in each category, and then we calculate, we calculate a score based on um, the number of reviews and the distance. And so kind of everything held equal, if I have an amenity that's further away, it's gonna lower my score. If I have an amenity that has fewer ratings, that's also gonna lower my score. And after that, we do a series of kind of filtering uh, processes. So first we filter for kind of um, low amenity score, and then we filter for kind of uh, lower population. And then the, uh, the cells that I have left over, we basically do a, a local Moran's eye for spatial autocorrelation and find those kind of clusters of um, low amenity scores. One thing that I should mention is that we actually ended up splitting the city into kind of an urban and a suburban condition with the idea being that kind of residents in these two types of urban spaces have different preferences or different tolerances for traveling to their local amenities. So for instance, at the heart of the city, you probably won't walk um, too far to go to your local grocery store, whereas in a more suburban area, you're likely to uh, drive uh, further or walk further. Um, and you can actually see from this um, distribution here, that's the population distribution. So the city is definitely kind of broken down into these kind of multimodal uh, conditions. Okay, so I'm gonna talk really briefly about the results. Um, the squares in red are Go City candidates. And as there is um, no hard data to verify our results, we had to do it through manual inspection of satellite images, um, street view images, and on the ground visits. Um, and what we ultimately did was to categorize all of these results into different stages of the real estate development process. So some areas may be empty because it's under construction or new construction, and some areas may be empty because it's halted or abandoned in construction. Um, 
Our model also picked up some areas uh, where construction hadn't started yet, as well as areas that were aging and likely to be turned into, uh, or likely to be developed in the future. Um, so on the whole, you can see that most of these areas we found were new or under construction, which makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, in a city like Shenyang, that's kind of known for its um, oversupply issues, we found more areas that are abandoned or halted construction, but in a city like um, Chengdu, which is considered like a gateway city for South Central China, there are no such abandoned or halted uh, areas. So the second portion of our method is more qualitative and involves more kind of ground truthing and talking to stakeholders. Um, so after we identified the different types of ghost cities, we actually went to China, investigated each of these areas ourselves. This is a picture of us um, flying a drone over one of our um, ghost city area candidates. Um, so I'll just quickly go over some of the different types of areas that we found. Um, the first one is under construction. The second one is empty land. Um, this one is abandoned, and we think this is some kind of like a communist era abandoned building, so not necessarily a newly abandoned. Um, new construction. Uh, aging, and I just want to add a note here about um, bias in the data. So we found um, this kind of aged area that was our ghost city candidate. Um, and indeed, these areas are aging, but when we went there, we discovered that actually there, it was very lively. So um, as you can kind of see, there's a lot of um, informal commerce uh, in, in this area. And because of their informality, these are not the types of amenities that are necessarily going to appear on websites like you know, Yelp or Dampain, whatever your you know, chosen um, amenities website is. Um, so like this flower seller is not going to be in Jinping. And you know, this is something that we should just always be conscious of is bias in the data, especially in crowdsourced data. We often have to be extra uh, cautious about data bias. Um, halted construction. And we actually created um, kind of a, like a field survey uh, kit for each of the, um, the sites that we went to. So we had like a kind of checklist and, uh, you know, places to kind of write um, our observations about the site. And kind of this was our way to um, gather some kind of systematic data about each of the different sites that we went to. And the second aspect of our qualitative research was um, talking to different stakeholders, such as academics, developers, and, and planners. Um, here's pictures of us talking to academics, developers, and planners. Um, the, so the important lesson to be learned here is that you know, we not only kind of learn the backstory of how China got into this situation to begin with, which basically boils down to um, too easy access to credit and, and ambitious growth targets, which is not dissimilar to the US, um, but we are also able to kind of confirm some of the areas that we found with people who know a lot more about the city and its real estate condition than we did. So for instance, um, we went to Shenyang and and we talked to um, developers who were like, oh yeah, that's kind of like, in that area that you found, it is a ghost city, but you know, the, um, the city had this kind of like super ambitious like master planning strategy that didn't quite work out, or like, you know, that area up north, it is a ghost, you know, it's vacant right now, but there's gonna be um, a car plant there in the next five years, and so it will be completely populated in a couple of years. So this is the kind of information that we got by talking to kind of people on the ground that I don't think we would have been able to kind of really access had we not kind of ground truthed our data. Um, so uh, that's it, and uh, thanks to the Civic Data Design Lab and Semtak Lee Real Estate Center for funding this project. Um, special shout out to Mike Foster, who, is, who also worked with me on this project and is here. Um, but yeah, thanks.